You know, I speak to so many people who have tried many diets. And some of these people have been guests on my show. Mm -hmm. And they all have, well, at least three things in common is what I found. Mm -hmm. One, they are expert dieters. You mm -hmm. just tell them the rules and they will follow them and they will lose weight. The second thing that they have, all of them have in common, is that after a period of time, they gain all the weight back. And many of them put on even more pounds. And the third thing that they have in common is that they blame themselves for not maintaining the weight loss. Right. And it can be so frustrating for so many people. They just want to lose weight and feel better and not feel bad physically and feel bad about themselves. And they're just chasing after things and not having the success course, there have been people on my show that have had success, but I'm glad that you're here today, Sid, because you're going to teach us the basic rules for sustainable weight loss. And <laughs> I love your title, how we can overcome the three biggest food mistakes, which sabotage our efforts. Yeah, wow. definitely. Big promise, Sid. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm in the same boat as you, Amy. I've seen the same thing over and over again. That's because today's diets simply don't work. And we're going to talk about why that is in just a minute during the presentation. Oh, yes. And we, um, we were having a little bit of a glitch, technical glitch when you first came on. And we were trying to get you to be able to put up your uh, presentation. I don't know if you've had any. I don't see it up here. So I don't know if you've had any luck to... Uh, to get that on the screen or not. Okay, let me try again. So I've got my PowerPoint up on my screen and I'm going to share my slides. And while, while we're doing that, I'm going to put up a, I'm going to start our game of true or false too. So that's way that the people that are watching can have something fun to do while we'll, we're working on these technical things in the background. So let's just, just start our game. It's time for True or False on Be Green with Amy Live. Answer true or false to Amy's questions in the comments below, and Amy will ask our guest for the expert answer. Okay, Green Warriors, while we fiddle with the technical stuff, the first question is going to be true or false, being overweight is the body's normal response to eating abnormal foods. So you think about that, Green Warriors, and we're going to be having Sid coming back on the broadcast, and she's going to be answering that question. We, we just put up our first true or false, Sid. Okay. And, yeah, and they're going to be answering that, that question. And while they're answer, put, typing in their answer, we're going to work on uh, you sharing your, your PowerPoint. So... Is that what it is? It's a PowerPoint? Yes. And you opened up the presentation and then um, then you open, uh, you click on present, mm -hmm. right? And then you click on uh, share screen. Share screen. Okay. Did you do that? Yeah. Okay. Let's see. Oh, I'm still looking for it. Okay. And... Uh, do you see where, is there a drop down list that says where you can uh, select your PowerPoint? Is it asking you if you have permission to share it? Let's see. Uh, it's not asking me that. Let's see. How's this? Is this better? Okay. Let's take a look. Oh, yes. See, she's got it. Yes, it is up. Okay, okay, I see it, and I'm going to be adding it soon. But meanwhile, let's get let's see what everybody's answering, and then Sid, you can answer this question because we have the answers from that people have been typing in. So, what do you? What's your take on this? And then, did you want to also do that with your PowerPoint, or or did you want to answer it first? Oops, I'm sorry. Is are you seeing my screen right now, Amy? I can see it, but I didn't put it up yet. I'll show you. I have okay. it there, but I'm, so did okay, you want great. to start your PowerPoint while you're answering the question? Yeah, it kind of ties in together. So that'd All be right, nice. well then let's do it. Here we go. Okay. 
Okay, so can I change the slides from here? I'm sorry, I'm not uh, being able no to change worries. my slides right now. So, okay, I guess you can't do use I... the arrow key? Can you use the arrow key? How's that? I see them okay, so beautiful. We're back. <laughs> All okay, right. so I think we're good. Yes. So the question was, true or false, being overweight is the body's normal response to eating abnormal foods, right? Is that where we left that's, off? Yes, that's where we left off. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All so right. What is, your, what is your answer? And you can talk the about it. The answer to that is definitely true, Amy, because okay. as we discussed, you know, people are struggling with weight loss all the time. And I can assure you, after a long period of coaching people, that being overweight is a normal response to eating abnormal foods. That's because diets simply don't work. They're just not sustainable. So instead of a long-term or um, a short-term diet that's a diet of restriction, we need to have a long-term lifestyle change that includes the right foods. Because going on a diet simply implies that we're going to go off the diet at some point and resume our normal eating patterns. That's one reason why the diet industry takes in $50 billion a year, because their business model is based on repeat customers. So let's take a snapshot look here at where we are as a country. So it's estimated that 45 million Americans are now... Uh, going on a diet each and every year, and they spend billions of dollars, as we just mentioned. Yet, in spite of all the diet plans available and all the money spent, our obesity rates just continue to climb. The United States now ranks 12th in the world as far as obesity rates go, but we're number one among the countries that are considered high-income countries. So it's obvious that whatever we're doing with our diet plans is not working. Okay, Sid, now, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but is, it, is there a way for you to go full screen on your slides? Because oh, we're yeah, still me, okay. seeing a little, little bit of the top of your screen. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> See, How's that? Not only, not only so... Uh, expert at dieting and weight loss and all these things. She's very sharp on technology. Okay, continue. Okay, well, don't say that too soon because now <laughs> <laughs> I can't forward my slide. So let me see if I can pull up my other slideshow and go okay. from there. Because sometimes the arrow key might be helpful too, but okay, we can try that. All sometimes right. You can move forward and backwards with the arrow key. Yep, that's what I am doing. So let me try okay, to sure. minimize this just a little bit and get it on the screen. Okay, there we go. I think we're good now. Okay. Is, so here's is, where we left off. We were talking about the standard back and forth American. between the, the, every time you do it, can you go full screen and then go off full screen and change? Is that possible? Because I know that some people may be looking on little devices and it may be difficult if it was too small. So that's a big okay, ask. Just, Sorry, Sid. <laughs> No problem. I'm just going to stay on full screen, which means I can't see you or I or the true false or anything. I'm just going to be looking at my okay. full screen of slides. Is that okay? Yeah, sure. Okay. All right. So here's the breakdown of what Americans are typically eating. And the standard American diet consists of 60 to 65% highly processed food, 25 to 30% animal foods, and less than 10% whole plant foods. And let's take a look at where those calories are coming from. Our number one source of calories is refined grains or refined carbs like white flour and grain-based desserts and cakes, cookies, pies, and pastries, and so on. And um, it, I mean, if you go into the grocery store, the aisles are filled with refined carbs and refined grains. So that's our number one source of calories. The number two source of calories is the added fats and oils. And that would include butter and margarine and olive oil, all oils, which we'll discuss in just a bit. So those refined carbs and these refined fats and oil make up more than half of the American diet as far as the source of calories. The third source of calories are animal-based products like beef, chicken, fish, cheese, milk, and yogurt. And the fourth source of calories are added sugars. 
ice cream, soda pop, energy drinks, alcohol, and the desserts that we listed uh, in the refined grain section in number one. There's a lot of sugar added to those refined grains. So each one of these four biggest sources of calories are highly inflammatory and they contribute to weight gain and poor health in a number of ways. We're consuming so many refined grains right now and added fats and sugars that pediatricians are now being advised to have the French fry discussion with parents at their child's 12 month checkup and no longer wait until the kids are two years old because studies are now showing that two thirds of infants are being fed junk food before their first birthday. So that's where we currently are. Let's take a look at where we can go from there. So lifelong weight control and good health require permanent lifestyle changes, as we mentioned earlier, not just a short-term restrictive diet. Dropping pounds isn't always the problem. As Amy mentioned, too, many people are able to lose weight. It's keeping the pounds off that proves difficult. So to lose weight and keep it off, there are four things necessary uh, for a long-term successful diet. The first one is, is it sustainable? In other words, is this something you can comfortably do for the long haul, you know, for the years to come? Or are you going to have to just keep eating tiny, small portions and feel deprived or hungry? Because as we said earlier, too, going on a diet often means that at some point you're going to go off the diet and return to your previous eating patterns. So ask yourself if you're considering a new way of eating, is this new way of eating going to serve me well over many years? Secondly, is it nutritionally sound? Will you be getting the protein and carbs and fat and calcium and vitamins and fiber and minerals and antioxidants that you need in the right amounts? And that's key because many diets do not provide those things in the right amounts. Will you be getting those things in the right amounts in order to function well? Or does the new plan ask you to purchase supplements or powders in order to meet your nutritional meet needs? And if so, why is that? Thirdly, is the new plan based on unbiased science? And this one can be so tricky because there are studies to back up any point of view pretty much or any theory. So in order to know if a, if a diet plan is credible, we always have to assure that the science that they're referencing meets certain criteria. Is the research independently funded, for example? Or is it research that's been sponsored by a food company or an industry lobby or a supplement manufacturer who, you know, people who stand a profit from the results? So on my website, I've created a list of seven ways to evaluate everything you hear and read. And I'll, uh, you'll see my website link at the end where you can check that out if you're interested. And the fourth thing that's needed, is it safe for my health? because the majority of diet books out there today are anything but good for your long-term health. Your new way of eating plant, your new way of eating rather should be able to offer weight loss without contributing to health problems down the road. And today's diet plans, which focus on high fat, high protein, low carb foods are known contributors to serious health issues. So we don't want to lose weight at the expense of our precious health right? The new way of eating should build our health, not destroy it. I like how Dr. Michael uh, Greger, he made a remark in his book, How Not to Diet, which I thought was really funny. He said that the goal of weight loss is not to lighten the load for your pallbearers. Mm. <laughs> so the long-term eating plan that can answer yes to all four of those questions, the only plan I know of that can say yes to all of that is a whole food plant-based, no added oils diet. Because this way of eating improves the quality of food rather than restricting the quantity of food. So not less food, but healthier food. So for those that are new, here's what the words whole food plant-based mean. It means eating plant foods in their whole natural state as close to nature as possible with minimal processing. Now, light processing, such as blending and cooking and freezing, all of those things are okay. But we do want to avoid any heavily processed items. For example, a potato is a whole food, but potatoes which have been converted into potato chips are not a whole food. 
an apple is a whole food, but once the apples are processed into Pop-Tarts, they are, of course, no longer a whole food. A whole food plant-based diet is not necessarily a vegan diet either because a vegan diet can technically include things like Fritos and Oreos and some Sara Lee pies even, none of which is being promoted here. So while it's true that everything we're eating is vegan, a whole food plant-based diet is just a much healthier way of eating than a technically vegan diet. Okay, so um, this might be a good time for a question, Amy. Okay, great. We are going to go for our next true or false question. So get rid of everybody because here it comes. So the next question that we have is true or false, calorie counting is the best strategy when it comes to losing weight. Hmm. Okay. Why don't you guys put in your answer, true or false, and let's have Sid give us her answer. Okay, Sid. <laughs> the answer is false because one of the biggest steps when it comes to long-term weight loss is to learn the difference between calorie counting and calorie density. Calorie counting is just not the way to go because not only is it often very inaccurate, it takes a lot of time and effort and a lot of willpower. It often results in these little tiny portions that aren't going to fill us up either. So it's not sustainable over time because who wants to be hungry? Nobody does, right? So calorie density, on the other hand, refers to the number of calories in any given weight of food, typically a pound of food. So foods that are high in calorie density have a large number of calories per pound, whereas foods that are low in calorie density have far fewer number of calories per pound. So here's how certain foods weigh in when we look at the calories per pound. Fruits and veggies, potatoes, whole grains, beans, legumes, and whole grain pasta come in between 100 and 600 calories per pound. Avocado, 750. Animal foods, ice cream, refined carbs, and white flowers between 1,000 and 1,400. Cheese and sugar, 1,700 calories per pound. Junk food and chips, up to 2,300. Nuts and seeds and nut butters like peanut butter are 2,800 calories per pound. Butter, 3,200. And oils are 4,000 calories per pound. So both the American Cancer Institute and the World Cancer Research Fund recommend that we lower our average calorie density of our meals to 567 calories per pound, which allows us to eat freely of the starches, veggies, fruits, whole grains, beans, and legumes. And of course, that's without the addition of a lot of added fats and sugars and oils. Now, for many people, those higher calorie dense plant foods such as the avocados and nuts and nut butters, those can still be used sparingly because that average is spread out over the day. So it's okay to use those um, higher calorie dense foods as a condiment. For example, uh, put a few slices of avocado in your burrito or toss a few walnuts in your oatmeal. But those foods that are higher in calorie density also have a much higher fat content too. So if you're trying to accelerate your weight loss or reverse a chronic condition, sometimes those higher fat plant foods are best eliminated or at least greatly reduced. So here's an example. I bet a lot of you have seen this already, how foods that are low in calorie density allow us to fill our stomach with a lot more food, but for far fewer calories. So this is what 500 calories looks like in a stomach. We see 500 calories of oil there on the left followed then by cheese, and then meat, and then potatoes, beans, rice and beans, and then fruits and veggies. And keep in mind that your stomach is about the size of your fist. So it's important that we don't starve ourselves, but we don't want to stuff ourselves either because our stomachs can expand to accommodate large portions when we overeat. So we want to focus on those potatoes, rice, beans, and fruits and veggies. And some of you might be wondering, well, wait a second, are you suggesting that we eat carbs like rice and potatoes? And the answer is definitely yes. <laughs> I know many people have heard that you know, all carbs are the enemy. And some people have even developed a condition called carbophobia, which is the intense avoidance of anything carb related. 
But remember, not all carbs are created equal. There's a big difference between healthy complex carbs and the unhealthy refined carbs. The complex carbs are the whole plant foods that we've been talking about. And those refined carbs that we want to avoid are the processed foods made with stripped and refined flours, refined sugars, added fats, lots of sodium. And that would be pastries and white bread and snack cakes, cookies, soda pop and chips. So for optimal weight and health, we want to focus on the complex carbs while avoiding the junk food refined carbs. Well, don't carbs make us fat? You know, that's the common misconception that people have. Carbs make us fat. And here's an example that I like to use. Um, and again, it doesn't, it depends what we're eating. Complex carbs don't make us fat. Fat makes us fat. And it's those refined carbs with the added fats and sugars that contribute to our weight gain. So here's an example I like to use. A potato is a nutritious calorie dilute complex carb and only 1% of the calories in a potato comes from fat until we fry the potato in grease to make fries, which is then 46% fat, or we convert the potato into chips, which is then 56% fat, or we smother the potato with butter, cheese, sour cream, and bacon bits, which adds a big dose of fat and cholesterol. So as you can see, the potato at 1% fat is not adding to our weight struggles. Our troubles begin when we process that potato into a refined carb junk food, or we douse it with high fat toppings. And fortunately, we can top our potatoes with a variety of really delicious, healthy, low fat toppings. All right, this might be a good time for another Q&A. Okay, so we have a quiz question about fiber, or we can continue on with our true or false. Oh, I will do the quiz question then. Let's do that. Okay. So this is the very first time we've ever had a quiz question <laughs> and not a true or false question. But we love Sid and she wanted to do a quiz question. So now you really have to do what my first grade teacher used to say, put on your thinking caps because you have yeah. to think about this answer. So with, yeah. <laughs> which, which food has the most fiber? And it looks like we have some choices up on the screen. It looks like we have four ounces of milk, four ounces of pork chop, four ounces of salmon, one egg. Oh, and Sid was kind enough to say, trick question. So yeah, be careful. careful when you answer this question. All right, <laughs> everybody's going to type in, Green Warriors, type in what you think the answer is. And Sid, what is the answer? The answer is it was a trick question for sure, because the animal-based foods like the milk and pork chops and salmon and eggs contain zero grams of fiber. Fiber is only found in plant foods, and it is crucial to our good health. I mean, very crucial. I just cannot stress that enough, how important it is that we get enough fiber. So less than 3% of Americans right now are getting the minimum oh. recommended. Oh, I'm sorry. I have to post this one. Are you ready? Apple a day said the garnish on the salmon has the fiber. <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't hear what you said. He said the garnish on the salmon has the fiber. Apple oh. a day. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> okay, we had to, had to have a little laugh, and, and the Green Warriors are laughing along with us. Okay, yeah. go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, no problem. You know, my screen is full with my slides, so I yeah. can't see you. So it's kind of. Oh, yeah. I have to make believe I'm talking on the phone. <laughs> So less than 3% of Americans are eating the minimum RDA of about 32 grams of fiber a day. In fact, most Americans get about half of that, like 15 to 17 grams a day. And those who continually eat a fiberless diet, like uh, you know beef and chicken and fish and hot dogs and cheese and yogurt and store-bought cookies, unfortunately, they're setting themselves up for a lot of different health problems, including a much higher risk for diabetes. So the healthiest people on earth are getting at least 45 grams of fiber every day from their food. And it's not unusual for whole food plant-based eaters to be getting 50, 60, or even more grams 
of health promoting fiber each day because again, plant foods are the only source of fiber. Fiber fills us up and that's what's gonna keep us satiated, which is necessary for sustained weight loss. So uh, as we'll see in just a minute, I'll talk about fiber and weight loss in a little, uh, little bit more depth. But if you think back to that calorie density chart, the pictures of the full stomachs were filled with you know, high fiber plants. So back to the uh, fiber too. Fiber helps regulate our blood sugar. It lowers cholesterol. It prevents polyps and diverticulitis, relieves constipation, and reduces the risk of cardiovascular disease and cancer because fiber helps carry out cholesterol and extra hormones right out of our systems. And that's one reason why it offers such great health benefits. But in addition to all the health benefits, how does fiber affect our weight loss efforts? Well, there are two types of fiber, soluble, which dissolves in water, and insoluble, which does not. And plant foods often contain both types of fiber, and both types are very important. So overall, fiber slows our digestion and it adds bulk to our diet. It keeps our bellies feeling full without adding the extra calories. Again, it regulates our blood sugars, it helps us sustain energy, and it boosts our gut health because our good gut bacteria thrive on fiber. Oatmeal, beans, all the foods listed here are excellent sources of fiber. So it is difficult to overconsume high fiber foods. Uh, for example, a bowl of split pea soup or black bean soup is hard to eat. Those have about 14 grams of fiber per bowl. And if you ate two big bowls of those, you'd feel like you're going to explode, right? You typically don't want a second bowl of, of a thick soup like that. And that's the fiber. So for every 14 grams of fiber that we consume, our calorie intake is reduced by about 10%. That's why the weight loss occurs naturally without hunger or deprivation because we're eating when we're hungry and we're full. Well, what about the man-made fibers like you know, Benefiber and Fiber One, the fiber products that are out there on the market? Those are, uh, what's, those are made with what's called functional fibers. Uh, you know, it's not a plant, it's made in a laboratory using some plant foods and those products will add fiber to your diet, but they do not offer the same benefits as when we consume fiber directly from our food. So how would this apply to you? Well, start by adding a variety of plant foods to your meals by making starch the center of the meals with the addition of fruits and vegetables. With recipes such as sloppy joes, cheesy Mexican tortilla bake, stir fries over brown rice, savory mushroom pot pie, peanut noodles with vegetables, plant-based macaroni and cheese, tacos, creamy chili pasta, one of my favorites, all sorts of different pizzas, carrot cake muffins, sundaes and sorbets, chocolate mousse with berries, barbecued lentil loaf with mashed potatoes and gravy, cheesy broccoli soups. Yes, there are ways to make cheesy soups and cheeses without using any dairy or animal products plant-based burgers, African peanut stew, my, one of my comfort foods here, black bean lentil taco soup, lasagna roll-ups, hearty chilies with cornbread, chickpea salad sandwiches, stuffed peppers. And as you can see, plant-based diets are anything but bland and boring, which is a big common misconception when we talk about a plant-based diet. So with these recipes, you're getting plenty of fiber and other nutrients too, like protein and calcium. So you never have to worry about getting those nutrients. Okay, now let's see, we are on to the next thing. So a daily menu might include oatmeal with berries and all the trimmings for breakfast, or salad and creamy potato soup for lunch, or stuffed peppers or lasagna for dinner with an optional healthy dessert. Okay, I think this might be a good time for the next Q&A. Okay, great. We are going to go for the next question. Okay, get ready, Green Warriors. True or false, olive oil has the least amount of fat compared to any other oil. So type in the answer that you think is best. And Sid, tell us what the answer is. 
The answer to that is false. All oils are 100% fat. <laughs> and we're going to talk about oils next, which is a good segue. So remember that calorie density chart that we looked at, and we looked at oils in the left-hand column, the most calorically dense food on the planet. And I'm always hesitant to call oil a food because really what it is, is the extracted fat from a food, right? Did you know that that's all that oils are, are the pure liquid fat, which has been pressed or extracted from olives or vegetables or nuts or seeds or coconuts or fish. And as just mentioned, calorie, uh, oils weigh in at 4,000 calories per pound. They are highly refined products, which are, are stripped of nutrition and all oils. It doesn't matter how it's processed or the source of the oil is 100% pure liquid fat. So one tablespoon has 120 calories and 14 grams of fat. And just three tablespoons per day, which is not unusual in the American diet because of all the processed food, bakery items, salad dressings, and restaurant foods that we're eating with oil, those three tablespoons a day can lead to three extra pounds per month without adding any bulk to the food. We're basically just coating our food with fat. Some studies are saying that Americans are eating four to six tablespoons of oil a day, hidden oils mostly, but oil as well. So not only are oils huge weight busters, but they are health busters as well because these extracted oils damage that protective endothelial lining on the inside of our arteries. And once that lining gets damaged, it paves the way for plaque formation. Oils impair our circulation. They are highly inflammatory, one of the most inflammatory things we could eat. And they contribute to blood clotting issues as much as animal fats do. Plus a diet high in fats like this is a leading contributor to not only cardiovascular disease, but it's one of the root causes for type two diabetes as well. So other added fats to be aware of would be margarine, which is typically made with all oils, butter, 100% fat, cheese, 70%, sour cream, 63%, and high fat dressings, ranch dressing is 75% fat. So I've had clients, you know, be so proud they're eating a big salad, but then I find out they're putting ranch dressing on the top and then we have to have the ranch dressing discussion. And so it's important to learn to purchase and prepare foods without the added oils and fats, because it's really hard to lose weight or keep it off when those high fat products are allowed to remain in the diet. So how does this apply to you? Well, if you eat out a lot at restaurants, first know that restaurant foods are loaded with oils and added fats, and it doesn't matter if it's a fast food joint or a gourmet restaurant. So if you regularly eat out, check the menu for potatoes and rice and beans and salads, pastas, portobello mushroom sandwiches, and healthy side dishes. Often you can build a great meal just from the side dishes on the menu. Um, I have a, a YouTube video, How to Eat Out, and it talks about this, scanning the entire menu because you'll see side dishes hidden in with the entrees that you might not have seen before. Next, ask about the hidden oils, especially in things like dressings and sauces. You might even want to bring a small container of oil-free dressing with you so that, um, you know, you're ready to go. You can order a salad and have your own little dressing with you. There's containers for uh, pretty much in every store where you can find those containers. And then lastly, ask how the food is prepared. We request that your food be steamed or baked or grilled over a dry skillet. And of course, you want to avoid anything fried or sauteed in oils. And restaurants are often very willing to work with you, especially if you call ahead and tell them you're following a special diet for health reasons, because you would be. Next, if you're the grocery shopper of the house, read your labels carefully and avoid the products which contain any type of oils. So this picture here is for Earth Balance butter. That's a vegan butter that I used to buy all the time before I knew any better. If you check the ingredient list though, you'll notice that almost the entire product is comprised of oils. There's palm fruit oil, soybean oil, canola oil, olive oil, and this product is 100% fat. You can tell because in the nutrition facts box there, uh, you see the calories are 80, 
and the calories from fat are 80. That means this product is 100% fat. What about if you uh, use oils when you cook, like I used to do all the time? That was step number two. Step one was get out the skillet, and step two was get out the oil, right, to coat the pan. I used to cook that way all the time. Well, to saute your veggies, like your carrots and onions and celery and peppers, heat up a dry skillet on high, add in your veggies, and Keep flipping them. When they start to stick, you only add tiny amounts of water or vegetable broth, just enough liquid to prevent them from sticking. If you put too much liquid in, the veggies are going to steam rather than saute. So you're just going to add little bits of liquid and keep flipping those veggies until they reach the tenderness that you want. And then for your baked goods, simply replace oil with unsweetened applesauce. Um, I use that as a one-for-one one replacement. So if a recipe calls for a third cup of oil, I just use a third cup of unsweetened applesauce instead. And you know those little six-pack containers you can buy of applesauce? One of those is about a third of a cup. So I also have a YouTube video on this topic. It's called How to Saute, Roast, and Bake Without Oil. If you're interested, you can check that out on my YouTube channel, which is Simply Sid Notter. So one more thing I forget to mention on the topic of oils is that if you're not convinced, which I've had people not be real convinced about this, and you feel you still need to eat some olive oil, then eat the whole olive, right? Eat olives sparingly, though, because olives are 80 to 90 percent fat, depending on the variety. So they'd be considered a condiment. But toss a few olives on your salad or on your pizza. That way you're getting the olive oil, the fat, the way it's meant to be eaten in conjunction with all the other nutrients in the olive so that your body knows what to do with it. Now, the next tip deals with the basic um, rule of weight loss. And I think we have a true false here, Amy, if you have. Okay. <laughs> yep. We're ready for the next one. Okay. Green Warriors, get ready. True or false. Out of all the sweets on the market, sugary drinks are the leading source of added sugars and calories in the American diet. Hmm. That's a good one. <laughs> all right. Type in your answers and let's see what Sid says. Go ahead, Sid. Yeah, the answer is true, unfortunately. Sugary drinks, sometimes referred to as liquid candy, are, have been blamed as perhaps the single largest driver of the obesity epidemic. So good, clean water should always be our first beverage of choice. But let's look a little deeper at some of these other beverages like sweetened soda and fruit juices and sports drinks and energy drinks and sweet teas and coffee drinks. So our bodies don't seem to register liquid calories as well as they do from solid food. Like when we eat solid food, our bodies take that into account and it adjusts our appetite accordingly. But when we drink extra calories, our bodies hardly regulate our appetites at all. So it, the studies are showing that over half the population over two years old and up are drinking sugary drinks on any given day. And that number goes way up to over 65% of boys are drinking pop or some sweetened beverage every day. And I don't know why they didn't include girls in there. I'm sure girls yeah. are drinking sweet drinks and coffee drinks and all that as well. Yeah, it must have been a specific study that they did just on in a boys' school or something. Yeah. So, yeah, back to our true and false. The American Cancer Society is saying that sugary drinks oh, are, are really the largest. Ad, uh, wait, wait a second. I lost my, my slide. Are you seeing my slide, Amy? I can see it just fine. and But okay. I can only see American Cancer Society remarks, but I can't see what they remark. Okay, so. I'll just read them to you. <laughs> <laughs> they say that sugary drinks are the leading source of added sugars and calories in our diet. And for cancer prevention, they recommend that we reduce our sugary drinks because those sugary drinks are putting on a lot of excess body weight, which is associated with an increased risk of at least 13 types of cancer. So how does this apply to you? Well, here's a way to tell how much sugar is in a drink. For example, there are four grams of sugar in one teaspoon. So if we want to identify how much sugar is in a product, simply find the grams of sugar listed on the nutrition label and divide those grams by four. 
So here we have a can of Pepsi and we see there in the nutrition facts box over halfway down, you know, under total carbohydrate, it says sugars, 41 grams. So 41 grams of sugar divided by four is roughly 10. So this can of pop contains the equivalent of 10 teaspoons of sugar. Think about that, 10 teaspoons. And this is for a 12 ounce can. Somebody drinking a 20 ounce bottle of soda would be getting 16 teaspoons of sugar. Also important is to notice the serving size here. The serving size on this one says one can, but sometimes on the bigger bottles, it can say two servings. So if you're if the bottle says two servings and you're going to drink the whole bottle, you would have to double the amount of sugar, right? <laughs> because the sugar is shown per serving. And then if we cock our head sideways and look at the ingredient list here, we can see that the source of those sugars is high fructose corn syrup and or sugar, which is refined sugar. And both of those are sugars that we totally want to avoid for a number of reasons. Now, there could be natural sources of sugar in a product, like from dates or fruits, but unfortunately, not all labels distinguish between natural sugar and added sugar. You're, so, sometimes you'll only see total sugar listed. But I have noticed that more and more manufacturers have begun to list added sugars separately, which is really helpful because it's those added sugars that we're concerned about. We're not necessarily concerned about a little bit of pineapple juice in a product, right? I mean, we're concerned about the added refined sugars. Um, in any case, reading the ingredient list is crucial because that will tell you what is the source of the sugars. Okay, so um, let's press on. These are more tips. I had one other uh, thing I was going to share, but I'm going to wait until another day for that because it's kind of lengthy. We're talking about weight loss today. <laughs> so not only is it important to know what to eat, but we also need to know how to eat. And these are the best tips which will assist with weight loss. And we've said this already. Don't starve yourself and don't stuff yourself. Eat when you're comfortably, when you're physically hungry, rather, and stop when you're comfortably full, but not stuffed. Remember, our stomachs can expand when we overeat. But if, in order to do this, we need to pay really close attention to our true hunger and satiety signals. Sometimes we eat just because the clock says it's noon or whatever, and we think, oh, it's time to eat. Or we graze and we grab food out of habit. I know if I leave set, something sitting out on my counter, I'm probably going to grab it every time I walk past, right? Because <laughs> it's sitting there. So there are many reasons that we eat that have nothing to do with being hungry. So in order to get back to our hunger and satiety signals, um, there's a scale here that will help. On a one, scale of one to 10, we need to ask ourselves how hungry we are. So this is the hunger and fullness scale, which describes varying degrees of hunger and fullness. And this is a good tool that can help us identify how hungry or full we really are. So this takes mental mindfulness to consider this. So five is neutral, right? We're neither hungry nor full. We're just neutral. If we go to the left there, if we go to level four, we're starting to think about food. At level three, our stomach is starting to growl and our thoughts are increasing about, I'm going to need to get something to eat soon. At level two, there's lots of stomach growling going on. Our stomach might actually hurt at this point and we need to get something to eat now. And then at level one, we are ravenous, which means we're past the point of headache, of uh, hunger rather. We could even have headaches, difficulty concentrating, low energy. And at level zero, I mean, we'd be weak and dizzy and might even be mentally impaired at that point. Now on the fullness side of the scale, six would be lightly full, might be hungry again in one to three hours. Seven is, yeah, I'm moderately full, but I'm satisfied. I'll be hungry again probably in two to three hours. Eight is you're full. You're comfortably full, but you don't want to eat anymore, right? And that's, that's a good point. Nine is that we're stuffed and we're past the point of comfort. Our stomach might actually hurt we, because we've eaten so much. And 10 is that we're so uncomfortably full that we might even feel sick. So it's normal for our hunger to fluctuate all day, you know, the fullness and hunger, fullness, hunger. But if we stay in the moderate hunger and fullness ranges, like between three to seven, 
that will help us avoid the extremes and hunger and fullness. Because if we wait to start, you know, if we wait till we're really hungry before we start eating, chances are we're, we're not likely to stop eating until we're really full. So if you start eating when you're empty or ravenous, you're going to eat a lot more than you would if you, you know, started eating when you're lightly hungry around the three part, through the three mark. So use this scale as a guide to help you mindfully connect to your body to figure out your true hunger signals. So the long-lived Okinawans in Japan who stay healthy well into old age and have the highest percentage of centenarians, they follow a practice called Hari Hachi Bu that teaches people to stop eating when they're 80% full. It's something they say before their meals as a reminder. And I think that's really cool. One of their proverbs says, eight parts of a full stomach sustain the man and the other two parts sustain the doctor. And isn't that the truth? And wouldn't it be great if we followed that example and were mindful of you know, our fullness as we were eating? Now, another way to get back in tune with our hunger signals is to be mindful of the difference between hunger and cravings. And we've just talked about hunger and how it usually occurs when we haven't eaten for several hours. And then your body is saying, I need food. And that's when you feel true hunger, you're going to seek out nutritious food, you know, not candy or cake. But cravings, on the other hand, can masquerade as hunger. Sometimes we might think we're hungry, but we're not. We're just having cravings. And those cravings push us to eat, you know, particular comfort foods like um, you know, the highly sweet things, fatty foods, chocolate, things like that, things that our body doesn't need for more fuel. But when we satisfy these cravings, you know, that can feel really good at first, but you, you might know, as I do, it often leads to feelings of defeat or guilt. But the good news is that cravings do pass when you learn to resist them and, and um, distract yourself by engaging in some other activity or you could fulfill that craving with a small amount of something healthy. I know like for a lot of addiction, food addictions, we say to totally abstain, and that's true. For food though, I like to say abstain and maybe replace. Like if you're craving something sweet, have a handful of grapes or a sliced juicy mango, you know, replace it with something healthy. Some of those uh, healthy, uh, having those healthy options in place is crucial because when a craving rears its ugly head, then you'll be ready for it. But do keep in mind if you're really hungry at that point as well, or if you are really just having a craving. So another way to speed up weight loss or maintain optimal weight is to preload. That's to start each meal with a low calorie dense food, such as fruit or a salad or a soup or even water. Preloading leads to consuming several less calories during the meal. And it's often thought to work for a couple reasons. One is that you eat something first. If you eat the most low calorie density foods first, when you're the hungriest, then you're more likely to eat more of them because you're the hungriest at that time. And second, preloading allows us time for our satiety hormones to ramp up, you know, before we dive into the main course. So preload with vegetables like a salad, of course, with a fat-free dressing. That's a great option because, again, keep in mind that fatty dressings or shredded cheese on a salad, you were, you're going to quadruple your calorie density count by doing that. So preload the food um, that, that are low in calorie density. It does have to be low in calorie density. Apples are shown to be the best fruit to preload with. I'm not sure why, but those are shown to be um, more successful than any other fruit. I'm guessing it's because of their they just seem dense to me, like, you know, the, the texture of them is dense. Preloading with vegetable soup is another great idea because not only is soup satisfying, but soup seems to be perceived as particularly filling, which might be another reason why we eat fewer calories overall when we preload with a low calorie density soup. The bottom line is this, pre, for preloading is start each meal with foods that contain less than 100 calories per pound, or per cup rather, per cup, like the veggies and some types of fruit or salads or soups, or even simply a tall glass of water too, that works too. In addition to preloading, 
when we eat can make a difference too. Now studies show, and, and these, uh, these tips are, some of these tips are coming from Dr. Greger's book, How Not to Diet. He talks about this principle called the King Prince Popper recommendation, which um, shows us that when we eat breakfast like the king, lunch like the prince, and dinner like the pauper, that means we're front loading our calories. We're going to eat the bulk of our calories earlier in the day. And the, the research that he cites were that two groups of overweight women were all given the same number of total calories to eat each day. The only difference was the order in which they ate. So the king, prince, pauper, those were eating, you know, their the bulk of their food earlier in the day versus the pauper, prince, king, the people who ate the most calories at dinner. And what the research showed that those who ate their calories earlier in the day lost more than twice as much weight as the other group over a 12-week period. So the big dinner group lost uh, 19 pounds. And the, I mean, the big breakfast group lost 19 pounds and the big dinner group lost eight pounds. So that's an 11 pound difference or about an extra pound a week. So even though they were all eating the same number of calories, Simply having the main meal at breakfast or lunch rather than dinner helped with the extra weight loss. Now, notice that even those who were eating later in the day did lose weight. So it's not, it's not like they weren't losing weight. It's important here to realize that it's what we eat is still much more important than when you eat, right? So for accelerated weight loss, though, the, prince, the king prince popper would, might be something to consider. Okay, so let's recap here. We've got to, for our tips for safe, permanent weight loss, switch to a whole food plant-based diet that's high in fiber and packed with nutrition. This type of diet also provides all the protein, fat, carbs in the right amounts. And for faster weight loss, avoid the higher fat plant foods. Avoid carbophobia. You know, we want to choose complex carbs while avoiding the refined junk food carbs. Avoid the added oils, which are 100% pure liquid fat. They are diet busters and health busters. Focus on calorie density instead of calorie counting, which fills your stomach with a lot more food for far fewer calories. Learn to tune into your hunger and satiety signals. Drink lots of good clean water and watch out for drinking your calories, like those sugary drinks especially. Uh, we could make iced green tea. There's things we can have beside water that won't uh, throw us off track with our diet. Preload each meal with low calorie dense foods and then front load your calories by eating more earlier in the day. And then this is another tip we didn't really discuss, but if you fast after seven o'clock for at least 12 hours, that seems to have great results for people. Fasting 12 hours from your last time, the last time you eat at night is a helpful tip. I didn't even talk about intermittent fasting here. There's just not enough time to delve into that. There's a lot of studies on it. But um, it does seem that fasting for 12 hours overnight is a good place to start there. And so if you're not hungry when you wake up, though, there's no need to rush to eat just because you have woken up and it's time for breakfast. You know, get back in tune with your hunger signals. So my website is sidnotter.com. My email is there. So on my website, you'll find a free training class, which covers some of the things we talked about today. It's called Three Food Mistakes That Lead to Painful Joints, Extra Weight, and Health Problems the Doctors Aren't Solving. There's also a free 21-day meal plan there, free dessert smoothies, a signed copy of my book. You can get there for 12 bucks and free shipping from my website too. If you have any questions, I'm going to stop sharing now. If I may, Amy, what do you think? Oh, very good. Thank you so much. That was lovely. You had so many wonderful uh, points and you really covered a lot. And we were having lots of comments, very positive things happening during the presentation. And people were enjoying guessing the answers to your questions. And when you <laughs> talked about apples, apple O'Day said that, yes, he, he agreed with you about the apples being a good thing to eat. So we had a question, and that was from, I think, from Deborah. So let's see. Yes. 
So Deborah said that, oh, no, no, we had one from Anne. That's right. So Anne said that in addition to eating the good things, I binge on very specific bad things. Nothing else with sugar will do. I never crave substitutes with good things, and the cravings keep coming. So, hmm. She never mm-hmm. craves substitutes with good things. You mean like by substituting good things? Perhaps? I, I think that that might be okay. what she's meaning. Yeah. yeah. So, um, Anne, could you like make a chocolate shake with just bananas and plant milk and cacao? That's a really good chocolate shake with no refined sugars. Um, those Dessert smoothies I just referenced might be a good thing for you because there's no sugar in any of those. It's all fruit or date-based sweeteners. Um, Yeah, so when I binge on very specific bad things, so I would would need to know more about the very specific things in order to think about some substitutions. But think about why, um, you know, physical food addiction is very real. So this may not even be your fault. Don't be beating yourself up. You know, you're, if you can take steps to address it once you know what it is. But yeah, sugar is highly addictive. I mean, studies show that mice will burn their feet to get to sugar, addicted mice, rather than cocaine. So mice that are addicted to sugar and cocaine, they will burn their feet to get to the sugar, but not to get to the cocaine. So it's very powerful. I yeah. wish I had better advice. I would need to see a, a food yeah. journal or something. Right. Or- well, here's a part of her food journal, cakes and pies from specific places. Oh, okay. So yeah. cakes and so, pies. Yeah. These are, I guess it's just when, maybe when she's out and about that these things are calling her name and that, that, and food addiction, like you said, it's, it is very real. So. Yeah. You just can't bring it home. So the decision to not bring it home, tell yourself, I don't eat that anymore. I've got something better I could eat. You know, mentally tell yourself that you're, you can't. <laughs> okay. Here, not I can't, but I uh, don't. You know, we talked about that in the mental tips. Yeah. It sounds don't like it needs to end her subscription with DoorDash. Oh, okay. So, yeah, she does. Well, you know, she's still bringing it home through DoorDash, right? Right, she's, but yeah. it's so much easier. It, before <laughs> these delivery services, we could just say, okay, I am not going to to get in the car. I have to go in the car and do all this just to go and get it. Now mm-hmm. you just push a speed dial thing or whatever, and and there it is. So it's it's a lot. It, they're making it so much easier, and, and I, I get that, yeah. That's a big thing, but I guess, and you don't, I think that it's just, you know, abstinence, I guess when, you know, if somebody was smoking cigarettes, right, you know, you couldn't say, well, I'll have one once in a while. Well, you you couldn't do it. And and we're here for you, Anne. Sid's here and I'm here and and this whole community is here for you. So, you know, it's, it's a difficult thing. It is. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, maybe you're just going to have to end that subscription. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I mean, Amy, would you recommend that she find healthier uh, cake recipe or healthier? Yeah, I think um, so. But but I think that that there's probably a connection to these specific places that have these specific desserts. There's it's not not just necessarily what she's eating, but it's some kind of an emotional connection that she has Mm -hmm. to those things. You know, and uh, I think it starts when we're kids. Our parents say, you know, if you're good, we'll have this or, you know, we're going to celebrate this. So we're going to go to this special place and have this. So I think that a lot of that was rehearsed, you know, way, way back. And our parents didn't mean to to do that to us in a, in a bad way. They were trying to do nice things for us. But we have all those positive associations with those things. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think at the end of the day too, right. When, especially it's like willpower is this muscle, but it's only can hold the weights for so long. And the longer Mm -hmm. you're holding on, the the weaker it gets. And then towards the end of the day, you're like, okay, I just can't, I can't do it anymore. I'm calling for the delivery or or whatever it is. So, yeah, I think you're right, Mm -hmm. Sid, having, having some other things in the house and just Maybe you're going to have to end that subscription for a while and, and make that promise to yourself. It's a tough it thing. Just, yeah, it might just be a habit too, because habits are so powerful. 
Mm -hmm. Is there something triggering that habit? You know, think about what is happening around the time you place that order. When habits become so ingrained that, you know, they've taken over our lives, then you have to change up the routine, maybe changing up the routine around that time frame when she orders the cakes and cookies, pies. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, I hope she comes on to, to, to your platform and comes back here and, and yeah. shares her progress because we're all here for you. And we, yeah. we want to help you out. Oh, and uh, speaking of that, Angela said, Sid has the best courses on her platform. I've taken a couple of them and they are filled with lots of helpful information and they are presented in layman's terms, which I appreciate. So that's very nice. And I, I think that's a great, a great little pr promotion there. And Angela wanted to know, do I recall, because we were talking about uh, fiber that Dr. Furman says beans have the highest amount of fiber. So is that for me? I don't know. <laughs> they are super high in fiber. I yeah. don't know if they're the highest source. I know quinoa or I'm no, I'm thinking of protein. protein there. Yeah. So yeah, I, I mean, beans are really high in fiber. Yeah. So it wouldn't surprise me. I haven't looked at which one is the greatest. Start, Lentils yeah. are high up there. Yeah, because I know I know that he said that they're high in fiber and resistant starch and that they're lower in the glycemic load than like whole grains and things. So as a, far as a carbohydrate, that it's a really good choice. And it also has the second meal effect. And he said the third and fourth meal effect where it stays in your body longer. And, and that may be a good thing for somebody who, like me, before I adopted this lifestyle, I probably was teetering on pre-diabetes and I would get these highs and lows of feeling, oh, I have to eat something. I have to eat something. And these beans just kind of stay, stay with you. So I think that that's, that's a really good thing. I, th I think split peas may be the highest. Fiber. You know, that might be because when I did that slide about the split pea soup, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, that had 14 grams of fiber per bowl. And then the black yeah. bean soup was right behind it. So, um, yeah. So beans and lentils. Yeah. <laughs> legumes. Beans and legumes. Yeah. And they're, and they are there for the win. So that's, that's a very great thing to, um, to think about. Let me just see if there's anything else. Um, I think that that was it as far as, uh, the, the questions. Well, we actually, we had more questions, but we don't want to keep you too long. So, and I did want to, I mean, you did mention your book, right? Which I have a copy of this book and it is fabulous. It has a lot of different components to it and a lot of great advice and a lot of uh, great tips in here. And I definitely recommend it. And I'm really excited because Sid has offered to give away a copy of this book. <laughs> so we're having this book giveaway and, and I'm going to be posting the link in the comments and in the show notes for how you can have up to five ways to enter for this book giveaway. So I'm really excited about that. And I, and I encourage all of you to take a look at this book because it's, it's wonderful. And Sid, you just, you, you hit it out of the ballpark again with all your pearls, wisdoms, and your tips and about weight loss. You really put, put it out in a very easy to understand way. And of course, whole food plant-based lifestyle for the win, right? <laughs> Yeah. And you mentioned up front that you notice that people feel guilty when they fail at diets. And I just want everyone to know that it's probably not your fault. You're not failing the diets. The diets are failing you. So when you get on board with this, you're going to give yourself the best chance. Yep. And I want to, yes, you're, you're, you're so right. And I hope that everybody uh, clicks like to show their applause and appreciation for, for Sid, because you just did such a wonderful job again. And I'm looking forward, because Sid's going to be coming back on the show again in, uh, next month. So we just love to have her. And, and she, every time she comes in, she always has some wonderful things to share with us. And I also wanted to tell you, we had a book giveaway last week, which was for Dr. Akil's book, Dr. Akil Taylor's book, which is called Open Heart. And now we are going to get to spin the wheel to see who wins this book. So I'm going to get ready to spin the wheel. So bear with me. So, cause I have another great technology thing going 
So here we go. How do people get into the uh, running, Amy? Yeah, I'm going to be giving them a link for yours to see, oh. and they'll go on the link, and it'll because they have to have all the rules and regulations. So oh. I have to be able to post that. So let's see if we can get this uh, going here, and let's see if we can have that. Uh, Oh, okay. Let me just make sure that I have the right one here. Okay. Let's see if this is it. Okay. So I have to get the the one that has the screen share that we can show for the, the book giveaway. Okay. Well, let's see. Oh, okay. I, now I see why. So just bear with me. You're going to have a little suspense here because we had it and then I... Uh, I took it away. Okay. Now I've got it. <laughs> okay. Are you ready, guys? We are going to spin the wheel and see who wins this book. So exciting. <laughs> <laughs> got all these names in here. Okay. Well, congratulations, Joanne. We didn't put her last name, but we have... Um, her her name and her email address, and we're going to let Dr. Akil Taylor uh, go ahead and send her the, that copy of the book for her, which is his book, which is called Open Heart. And we're going to do something similar to this next time when we give away Sid's book. And like I said, we're going to be telling you in the show notes and, and in the comments how you can go ahead and do that. So thanks again, Sid. You were just fabulous. And I wanted to, if you can, you, you told people a little bit, but I want to give you another chance. If you can just tell us where can we find you and, and uh, how can people connect with you? Yeah, my website is sidnotter.com. You see my name there, C-Y-D-N-O-T-T-E-R.com. That's the website. And on there, you'll find all the freebies that I mentioned, um, my courses, a link to my book. And I do a weekly newsletter. It comes out every Wednesday. So it came out this morning already. It includes an article on nutrition, a recipe that I have found in love, weekly words of encouragement, and then the joke of the week. Oh, yes. Because that's an important <laughs> part of, of life is to not take it to everything too seriously. Uh, I yeah, love we that. Need more laughter, right? Yes. We need more laughter in the world. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, yes, that, that was fabulous. And Green Warriors, tell us, answer this question in the comments. What are you going to remember? What is one of your takeaways from today? And I also wanted to thank Just Task Voice. She did the countdown and she did the promos and she helped promote this event as she always does. And Just Task Voice, can you tell us who is coming up next? Sharm Ridley is in her early 60s. She takes no medicines and is a living testament to the power of plants. Sharm will show us how to prepare delicious plant-based Atlanta Creole recipes on Wednesday, June 14th, 3 p.m. Eastern, noon Pacific on Be Green with Amy Live. Oh, I'm looking forward to that. She always has some wonderful recipes to share. Well, I also wanted to thank the audience. Thank you, the Green Warriors, because you joined us today. And without you, we wouldn't be here. And as a special thank you to all of you, I want to encourage you to go to begreenwithamy.com slash join, and I'd be happy to send you five free recipes and a, some fun photos of things that I do and a lot of uh, has some words of encouragement there. And I would like to invite you to take your right hand and grab your left shoulder and take your left hand and grab your right shoulder. Now squeeze. That's a hug from me to you. And if you would like to join me with Sid, we did this yesterday, right, Sid? <laughs> now we're going to do it again today. And you can type this in the comments and join us in saying, until I see all of you again, remember, be strong, be well. And be, be green. green. <laughs> thank you so much, Sid. Bye, <laughs> Green Warriors. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Bye-bye now. Bye. -bye now. Bye.
Bye-bye. Now you can listen to Be Green with Amy expert interviews wherever you go. Listen while walking, meal prepping, or traveling. Find Be Green with Amy on Apple, Google, Alexa, Amazon, or virtually anywhere you find podcasts. Be strong, be well, and be green with Be Green with Amy.